Thank you. All right, so basically for the assignment, I had to like pick my beat. And so I decided it would be environmental news specifically. And so okay. I was kind of like wondering, like as an expert on the topic, uh, what environmental issues do you like see most frequently featured in local media? In local media? Mm -hmm. um, I think climate change issues are quite frequently covered. You know, that, that seems to be at the forefront of most people's uh, attention. Uh, also, you see things like salmon, uh, anadromous fish that have conflict with dams, um, dams, forestry, land use. Uh, you know, salmon are iconic uh, creatures of the Northwest. They're commercially important. They're culturally important. And so people care a lot about uh, sustaining salmon runs. And then you see kind of hot button issues like uh, the pebble mine uh, proposal up in Alaska, in, in Bristol Bay, uh, you know, that tends to get people fired up. Some people want big um, economic projects like that to go forward. Other people say, look, th this is one of the last remaining highly productive, unimpaired uh, fisheries in the world. Let's not imperil that with a giant mine. Uh, so you see issues like that um, more locally. Uh, in the news, in Washington state, for example, you'll see conflict over wildlife management. For example, uh, wolves uh, are kind of a hot button issue uh, in the region as uh, wolves have recolonized a lot of the habitat uh, from which they were um, expelled in the early part of the 20th century. And now, now there's debate over how much habitat should be permitted to have uh, viable wolf packs again, you know, on, on uh, on the side of livestock producers, they, they obviously don't want to see a major coursing carnivore return to the landscape. There's potential for conflict there. A lot of people who hunt don't want to see wolves. Uh, they perceive that wolves compete with them for game animals like deer and elk. So you'll see that show up in the news quite a lot. Uh, so how and when we should manage these large carnivores like wolves, mountain lions, and so forth, that will also make it into the news cycle. Okay. So you brought up that kind of issue of the wolves specifically. Um, do you think like when they're reporting on these issues that they offer both sides of the story? Oh, sorry. I thought my dog was scratching to get, get back in the house. She's not. Large carnivores. That's Sophie. <laughs> Aww. She's so Sophie. cute. Say hi. <laughs> oh, back to her couch. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, where were we? Um, oh, you're good, you're good. I was just saying, you brought up the issue of the wolves specifically. Um, and do you think that like in the news cycle that they offer both sides of the story, like the sides that people want to like keep hunting, but then also the side that we should still keep these regulations because it's better for the animal? Yeah, more or less, you know, uh, I think I think most journalists try to seek out people on different sides of the issue. Sure. Okay. Um, and then kind of like what issues do you feel like the media is missing currently? Um, environmentally? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think, and this, this partly reflects my bias as a forest ecologist and as a forest manager, but, you know, managing our forests to be climate adapted and uh, to be more wildfire resilient, you know, that really should be more at the forefront, especially in a forested region like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you probably are familiar that, uh, with the fact that in our dry forests, ponderosa pine woodlands, dry Douglas fir forest, um, we've suppressed fire for well over 100 years as an institutional policy. But historically, those forests would burn pretty frequently. Every, every 10 to 25 years or so, fire would burn through and it would be fire that would burn along the ground, consuming fuels, uh, reducing uh, the, the number of trees that make it to the overstory. So it would keep the forest more open. And that would do a number of things. For one thing, that would uh, reduce the amount of water required by that forest stand in terms of soil moisture, keeping the, tree, the trees that are there more vigorous because they're competing less for water, for nutrients, and, and for light. Um, and also, it would, those frequent fires prevent fuels, whether living fuels or dead fuels, from accumulating in the ecosystem to the point where it could carry a more severe fire. And so by suppressing fire, we actually made the wildfire problem worse. Um, 
And you'll see this referred to as the mega fire problem. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're seeing much larger and more severe fires in our many of our Western forests than ever would have occurred historically. And that's been backed up by abundant research on the historic behavior of fire. People who've studied the changes in what we call the fire regime. Okay. Hmm. So well, I think that that really could use a lot more uh, attention from the press because uh, the press could play a really important role in educating the public on kind of the complexity of that issue and and the fact that we need to, we need to have more fire back on the landscape and some of the stands we might need to actually actively manage using thinning operations and so forth to restore some of their historic features like an open canopy. Okay. So like, since we've already been suppressing the fires for so long, like what would be a possible solution to that to like take now? Well, you could go in and, and you could do a, a selective harvest where you remove some uh, portion of, of the trees there. Uh, those, those could, that could either go and be commercial material utilized in the forest product industry or not. Um, but the point is, is that you're, you're deliberately reducing the density of trees in that forest landscape and then you could reintroduce fire as a process. Because to reintroduce fire into many of these overstock stands, um, if it's cool enough to carry a fire, it wouldn't kill enough trees to thin the stand. And if it's warm enough to carry fire, it could get out of control. So actively managing those stands could help us cut a middle path between those two outcomes and restore healthy, low severity fire. So educating people as to the complexity of that process and when we need to be very active about our management or not uh, is would be an important role that the press could play. Yeah, that's interesting. I've not seen that one before. Um, who, who else do you recommend that I talk to for like um, ideas or other experts on environmental science specifically? Well, I mean, anybody in the School of the Environment um, uh, would be good to talk to. I, I think people uh, there are some folks who study aquatic ecosystems, and they might have a different perspective. Alex Fremier, F-R-E-M, here I'll put a chat. Um, Alex Fremier, that's how you spell that. Let me check up his email for you. He'd be really good to talk to. Um, Alex, yeah, it's just Alex .fremier. Um Alex Vermeer at wsu.edu. So he's an aquatic ecologist. Uh, Sarah Rowley would be lovely to talk to. She's an aquatic ecologist. Um, uh, let's and hydrologist. So let's see, Sarah. I think it's just Sarah Rowley at wsu.edu. You know, another person that could be cool to talk to would be Jen McIntyre at uh, the Puyallup campus, and she studies salmon issues and pollution, water pollution. Um, and she she gets a ton of press. I think she works really well with with uh, journalists. <laughs> so she might be nice to talk to. Let me find her email for you. Well, thank you. Yeah, Jen McIntyre. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. If you want somebody to talk to about wildlife, Lisa Shipley. So again, Lisa Dodge. Or no, hers is simple. I think it's just Shipley at, let me check on that for you here. Yeah, it's just Shipley at wsu.edu. She's a wildlife ecologist. So anything to do with wildlife, she'd be good to talk to. Um, like, could you narrow it down or just environmental issues, broadly speaking? Just broadly speaking at the moment, we're just getting started. Yeah. So I don't really know yet. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, we're the school of the environment, so almost any of the faculty would have a reasonable handle on the broad suite of environmental issues. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I don't you bet. think I have any so, more. Uh, are there other environmental issues around which you have curiosity or? Um, not at the moment. I just kind of had to pick a topic and now I can do my deep dive, <laughs> so hopefully I can figure out some of the issues that I'm passionate about specifically. Okay. Well, sure. Yeah, I think, I think for one more issue. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. You first. One more issue that comes to mind is just uh, development. You know, we're losing a lot of land uh, to commercial or residential development. And of course the supporting road infrastructure for all that. Um, 
And that's, that's a major environmental issue because, you know, taking something, taking the landscape out of good farmland, out of forest, out of wetlands, um, out of shrub step, any of these ecosystem types, um, you know, that's going to have, that's going to carry a severe environmental penalty. And uh, a lot of people don't really realize the, the cascading environmental effect of, of development of losing land uh, from an open or uninhabited condition. So that's a major environmental issue. Okay. Hmm. All right. For well, example, if you look at a lot of the development along the foothills of the East Cascades, or even the foothills over in the West Cascades, um, big subdivisions are, are being built. Mm -hmm. And that's the winter range for animals that spend most of their year at, at the high elevation. So the, su the summer range is up in the mountains. It's on national forest or in parks, et cetera. People view that as the habitat, but they don't look at the lowlands as playing that crucial seasonal role of being the winter habitat for those organisms. So when the animals come down for the summer, they, they find their, their uh, seasonal migration pathways blocked. That's another major environmental issue. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh. All right, I'll have to look into that one then. Awesome. All right, well, I think that's everything I had, unless you have any other general comments you want to make. No, uh, I mean, it's, do you have the info you need to write your assignment or? I do, I think I'm good. <laughs> okay, well, good. Well, are you gonna go for a career in written journalism or, or broadcast journalism or what's your, what's your plan? Sort of undecided at the moment. Uh, I went in with written journalism and like wrote for the Daily Evergreen and everything, but now with COVID. Oh, good sort of system being shaken up. It's a little bit different. So just kind of rethinking my options. Sure. Still undecided. Good. But um, I think at this time. Oh, sorry. Uh, my roommate, uh, Mackenzie Perry, said she had you as a professor and recommended you to me. Oh, good. Yeah, I remember Mackenzie. That's wonderful. Yeah, she's super sweet. She was, she was like, he'd be a good one to talk to. He'd be willing to talk. <laughs> Good. Well, I hope you think she was right. So <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. My pleasure, Brooklyn. It's really nice to meet you. Yeah. And uh, good luck with your career and your class and everything else. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good day then.